Hi everyone, good to be here. I'm now a group called Policy Cures. Uh, we uh, specialise in global health policy around um, making new products and neglected diseases. And we have offices in London and Sydney. We were set up in 2004 at the London School of Economics. We've rolled out independently. But, um, but there's an enormous amount of work happening in this field now because it's all new. I'm sure I might get rid of this. I'm running out of space. Is that better? I can talk up as well, that's fine. So uh, I've, I'm going to talk probably for about 10, 10 minutes. I don't know how familiar you are with ne neglected disease drug development. Is anyone, apart from, does anyone here know much about it? Well, then I, I will go. <laughs> okay, I will go through some of the basics then. Um, as you as you all know, uh, the underlying problem is that uh, patients in the developing world have very limited access to new drugs. To new and for diseases like diabetes or hypertension or cancer that are shared with wealthy patients, people like us, uh, a lot of that stems from, from patents, uh, from how intellectual property, property uh, works. And the thing with uh, patents have uh, uh, big uh, benefits and big drawbacks in a, in a sense. So how patents work is the patent monopoly is what sucks in money. So if you say, I have a monopoly on a market worth $10 billion, that brings in a lot of shareholder money which you can invest in R&D. So that's the good side. They, they draw in bucket loads of cash, and that means governments don't have to pay for R&D, which they like. And they don't have to bear any of the risks of failed products, which they also like. The negative side is that the control is then, of course, handed over to the people who are providing the money. So the decision on what kind of R&D we'll do, what we'll focus on, is really determined by companies and their shareholders. Um, they set the prices to maximise profits which is what they're meant to do, their business, and they need to repay their shareholders for their investment. And the other thing is there's very, there's very little collaboration because if I've got something worth potentially $10 billion driven by secrecy, I really don't want you to know what I'm working on and you might pay. So, then I, so patents have real pluses and minuses. Big plus, poor, pull in loads of cash, but there's the negatives. So the good news is None of this applies in the neglected disease area, malaria, leukemia. By definition, these, these diseases don't have a market. The patents are worthless. Uh, they cost you money, if anything, to maintain the patents. So what that means is that in the neglected disease area, you don't have the drawbacks of patents, very, or only to a minor degree, but you don't have the benefits of patents either. So you get a really different set of problems. So in terms of, so neglected disease R&D essentially exists in a kind of parallel world where IP is just a, a um, it, it's like a ghost. It's not the main uh, incentive and it's not the main source of money. And it's not the main source of, well, it's not the main source of any of the drivers of R&D that you see in the commercial world. Now, on the, this has some really uh, strong benefits. The first is because the IP is essentially worthless. I mean, if I've got a drug for beryllium ulcer, I can only ever lose money on it. It affects no one knows how many people in West Africa, maybe 10,000. So if I spend money making it, I will have to give it away for free. So I'm holding a piece of intellectual property that's worth minus $150 million. The good thing is that companies are more than happy to share this stuff and give it away. Not initially, because they're so paranoid around patents, even a patent on something worthless, they would cling to it for dear life. But as time's gone on, they've become much more open about giving, giving um, IP away or sharing IP. Worth, IP that's, I say worthless. In the health sense, it's incredibly valuable. In the commercial sense, it's worthless. So, and there's lots of examples of that. For instance, WIPO's got a, um, well, Richard will know this, the World Intellectual Property Organization has now got a database of uh, IP for any neglected disease, that's um, uh, uh, compounds, data, patents, there's a long list of what's included that you can use to make neglected diseases and that's openly available. 
Um, there's other patent pools. BioVentures for Global Health has a patent pool where GeoTrace can all its patents related to neglected disease. A lot of companies allow their compound databases to be screened for neglected disease, not for any commercial uses, but for neglected disease. They're much more open. And the second thing is that R&D is much more collaborative in the neglected disease area, uh, which is something, you, as you point out, you just don't see commercially. But people have nothing to lose. There's no problem me sharing my idea with you if my idea is not, I will never make money from it, um, and, and neither will you. So you get more collaborative R&D, which, as we all know, is, is, is faster, it's better quality. You've got a lot of the best brains applied to it. It's a great way of doing R&D. Um, and what we see in the neglected disease field, if you exclude NIH funding, which is mostly basic research, about more than 40% of the R&D is done now collaboratively in, in product development partnerships. That's where you might have a piece of academic IP, you'll have a company working on it, someone in, uh, someone in India might be working on it, trials will be done by groups of academics around the world, and that's the norm in neglected diseases. But this isn't fully open, these are not fully open source, they're collaborations, but they're, they're still smaller, it's not everyone it's not like the Indian OSDD where you get hundreds of students potentially looking at something. But it is the case that you have people working completely collaboratively on the same IP. Um, small teams in, in several countries and from different organisations. Um, and an and a example from a company is GlaxoSmithKline recently opened up its first gun cell site in Spain to acad any academic researcher can come and work there with other academic researchers on their ideas, on their intellectual property, uh, or with the GlaxoSmithKline scientists on their intellectual property. So it's a, it's a real, um, a, 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 it's a sort of mini open source approach. So there are all the good things about the IP being worthless. <laughs> the bad thing, of course, is the IP is worthless, so there's no way of funding it. There's no attractive patent. You hold it up and say, I've got a patent worth minus $500 million. Shareholders, who'd like to buy this? And there, there's just nothing happens. So this stuff didn't get funded for decades. Um, but so that's we've got a different set of issues in neglected disease. Patents aren't the central issue for us. The central issue for us is um, how do we fund it? Can we capitalise on the fact that patents are, don't have as much value? Are there freedoms that we can capitalise on because of that? Um, and how much money are we going to have to raise to do this? That's traditionally been kind of secret drug company information. What is it? And periodically they'll come out and say it costs a billion, or someone recently said it costs five to nine billion. Did you see that anyway? <laughs> you know, if, if someone tells you something costs a billion or it costs nine billion, it means that you, you're not getting the real story. So there's a number of questions revolving around who should fund it, how much money do we need, can we redesign it in ways that capitalise on the fact that this stuff's not worthless, which is work essentially commercially worthless, that frees us up, and so on. Now, some of those questions are actually already been answered. So if we look at who should fund it, um, $3 billion a year is now put into making neglected disease products. A lot, we do a global um, audit of what's spent. And it was a figure that really surprised us. It was much larger than we thought. But it's three billion a year, and all of that is raised outside the market because the patent, uh, the patent mechanism doesn't work in the neglected disease area. So that three billion comes from, two billion comes from government. About a half a billion comes from philanthropy, mostly the Gates Foundation, some from the government. And about a half a billion comes from companies, drug companies. So that's, as I said, that's all funded outside the market, outside the patent system. The, the patent itself doesn't play any role in raising that money. Um, of that, about a half a billion, some years 600 million goes to malaria uh, product development, and of that, about 40% goes into making malaria drugs. So it's normally between two and 300,000 a year invested in making uh, malaria drugs. It's not a huge sum of money, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's, um, did I say thousand? I meant million. It's 200 to 300 million a year invested in malaria drugs. So it, it's not a, <laughs> that's a big difference. It's not a huge sum of money in commercial terms, but that's actually plenty of money to make, uh, to make products if you, if you do it sensibly. If you're not having to factor in, for instance, a large profit margin. Thank you.
And then if I could ask, the, the money that you talked about, that, that's money that's... No, this is development of new malaria, novel malaria products. So we actually have a searchable database and you can see, so what we track is investment in um, discovery, preclinical, early clinical, only up to the point of registration. So this is all novel products. Oh, oh, it's actually my next point I was going to tell you. That, uh, I can tell you, but hold on the mic because you want to ask me a question after that. So where that money's going, that $3 billion, there's over 300 new neglected disease candidates and products that are in the pipeline since 2000. So there's 20 registered. There's 23 that are about to go to the regulator, so in the final stages of trials. And of those over 60, I think it's 66, we're, we're just finalising the count for malaria. And the seven new malaria drugs that have already been registered, only five of those are actually useful. There's two that are not. Um, but as I said, all of that's happening outside the IP system. So to your question, this is all products in the pipeline and it's all money in the pipeline, so it's just R&D. So everything I'm talking about now isn't existing products or anything like that. It's, it's solid R&D up to the point you register it. We don't track funding after that because our specialty is looking at how you, how can you get new products for neglected diseases because that's been the gap. And initially people said, oh, it's because of patents, but it's actually not, in our field, it's not because of patents, it's because it's a market failure and what you actually needed was for governments to say, hey, look, I can't leave this to drug companies. It's nothing to do with them. This is not a commercial enterprise. This is a public good. This is a market failure. It's my responsibility. So when governments stepped up to the plate and went, actually, if people with no money need drugs, that's that's me. That's taxpayers. So it's nice to say, oh, companies are evil and don't do it, but actually this is our, our responsibility is to say to our government, I want you to, I believe this is important, I want public money to be spent on this, and, and to pressure companies to say, you make a lot of money, I believe some of that should go to charitable investment, which, which they do actually. A, a lot of the money does now come from companies, much more from companies than from most governments. Companies put in more than Canada, Australia doesn't puts in almost nothing to product development. They're just changing our policy now. Um, we put in less than any of the other investor countries in the world. Um, so it's really interesting. So can I pursue that more? So, so you're, you're making a distinction between product development and basic research. Where do you draw the line? Um, no, we actually include the whole thing. What, I suppose what I'm saying is when you look at how you, governments invest, normally they invest in the whole spectrum that's needed to get something to a patient. That's what we care about. That means from the discovery stage right through to registration. Australia essentially stops at the point where it's, it gives money to its own research institutions, but at the point where you would move on from that to start developing it with companies or with PDPs or whatever, we've traditionally not funded that. And Australian groups that want to make products, a lot of their funding comes from overseas. So Australian groups get funded by Irish aid or overseas aid agencies give money to PDPs who fund Australian. That's what's been happening. And to its credit, the Australian government's reviewing that now. They've had a review that said you need to start investing in medical research. AusAid needs to start looking at this. Um, and and they accepted that recommendation and they're now working on this. So yeah, you need both. So basically there's a ton of money, not a ton, but three billion, a fair bit, um, and a lot of activity. So the next question was, uh, can you uh, can you capitalise on, on this kind of freedom from not, uh, of the patents not being valuable? So uh, does it have some advantages? And the first one is yes. I mean government funders or funders get complete control. They can decide what to focus on. They prioritise public health problems. They can decide how much money goes in. They can have a lot of control over the final price because this, most of this stuff is done not for profit. The final price is a low or no profit price. Um, but they have to take over the risk of and the role of funding. So that's the, that's the trade-off. You put up the money and take the risk, you get to call the shots. In terms of the actual R&D, are there real benefits from doing this about the patents not being so valuable? And the answer is yes, but the gains are actually quite modest in the neglected disease area because specifically because the patents aren't so valuable, so those, a lot of those hurdles aren't there. 
And so I'll just explain that a little bit more. The, the cost savings are, are fairly, the real benefits are that you get uh, collaboration, you get more brains working on things. That's the, that's the really big benefit and that's indubitable, that's the biggie. But the cost savings are, are minor and I'll explain why that is. If you look at product development, you start at this end, this is the discovery stage and it's really cheap. A discovery program might be three or four hundred thousand dollars over three years. But your failure rates are very high, 19 out of 20. So that's where open source works best because open source is really good at sharing data. And what you're doing at that end is sharing a lot of data. Now even if you reduce your failure rates by 25%, you're only going to save a few hundred. What you will do is get a better quality idea and hopefully faster. But you, it's not that you, can, you can't sell this by saying you will save a lot of money or get a cheaper product because you won't. Your product will, they're all not for profit anyway. Pretty well all of them are not for profit anyway and you can't get cheaper than that. The next stage you move along to is preclinical. That costs a little bit more but here you have open source can do some things quite well like looking at the chemistry uh, so that you can manufacture it, the CMC, cheaper ways of making things cheaper formulations. But at that stage what you're doing is, is work and it's much harder to share work than it is to share data. You need someone to inject it into a mouse. You need, and you, the cost savings of having people do that in 50 mice in 50 different places aren't much compared. It can be harder. So where you're sharing data there's, it works very well but where you're sharing work it works less well. So at the stage where you're doing preclinical costing you maybe three million a year and six and seven year products are going to And then you move down to clinical and then it gets really pricey. It might be 15 to 20 million to do a trial and you might need to do several trials and the failure rates are three in four in early clinical and then one in four in late clinical. So when you add it all up it comes to like 150 to 200. Fail all the way along. So you have 20 projects that you pay for, 19 fail, one goes forward. Uh, you know, and then you do that over a hundred projects and you get your five that have come forward and of those four fail. You know what I mean? So you have to have a lot of projects at the start that whittle down to one and you pay for the failures all along the way. And that's why governments hate paying for R&D because they feel very vulnerable. They, they don't feel comfortable with, with the idea that, that that's how it works. That's what one drug represents. It represents 200 ideas. And what we're looking at ways of making that more efficient and open but as I say, the savings in, it's not the cost savings. I don't think that's what we should be promoting. It's the fact that um, you can get better ideas up front. You can work on things more efficiently up front. And you can decrease your failure rates a bit. But as I say, the costs, the costs really are come in the product development and that's where it's very hard to open source. So I suppose what I was hoping that people wanted to discuss was to say, I think open source is the most possible. It's the easiest to do in the neglected disease area because the IP isn't, um, IP and collaboration aren't such big issues, which is what makes it very doable. And I, I really encourage Matt and others to to do it. But it also has the least, it has the least additional benefit specifically for the same reason because people already collaborate and work together because the IP is worthless. But what I what I think is the real interest of it is that I think it's a really interesting pilot for how you might move into more commercial areas. Commercial areas is where it's most needed and most difficult. And drug companies are really looking for a different way to do R&D. They know that they can't afford this system where they all work in secrecy on an idea which may fail and they don't share information and they want something different. And trialling out this open source approach where you keep it open as long as possible is I think very interesting because if you look at a commercial area it's unlikely they'll ever let go of IP I think and it's very hard to make a product open all the way along although I'm interested to discuss that. But um, I can see that if you could keep it open as long as possible it would reduce the cost and risk which would make it cheaper. So that's a bunch of ideas to throw open to everyone. I, I think neglected disease is the, is the the testing ground because you get R&D and public funding and a, a experience in collaboration uh, without some of these without some of these constraints. So I'm, I'm, I think it's
Thanks. So there's um, just one question from the uh, online audience here. Uh, Hazel asks, uh, um, what percentage going towards phase three evaluation of the house? Do you have any? Um, I don't have the figure with me, but we have a, um, as I say, we do a survey every year called GFinder, and we have a searchable database. Break it down by, clin we, we do measure how much goes into clinical for each drug, so you can, for each disease area, and you can work that out. Uh, it's not broken down by phase, though. It's actually quite hard collecting information from donors. Some donors originally didn't track their funding by disease. They might do it by infectious diseases and not individual. Track it by product. So it's actually very difficult to get by disease and product, then by stage clinical, and then by sub. I'd love to have it. So you can find by clinical, but it's very hard. To Hi, Ed. You were talking about reasons why you think that's Certainly, I think that that point you made is a good reason. But I think there are also a couple of other reasons. Another reason is that people already working in the No, no, I, I think I, I think that's true. But I think that's also true of cancer researchers. If you look at people in universities around Australia who work on cancer, they they do it because they want to find a cure for cancer. They're, they're not interested in money. Academics on the whole all work for that motivation. It's just that if it's for cancer, they're conscious and their university tech transfer constantly reminds them that this could be valuable. They need to keep it secret. Um, but they may be able to sell it to a bio it will bring in money to the university. So that's a real driver. Whereas no tech transfer officers coming down and saying, your sister Samaya's has struggled, which is going to lose millions. Keep that secret. <laughs> you know, so I think that's, I think, well, I, I think um, academic research is generally really well motivated and, and would like to be more collaborative. The publishing issue I'd like to hear about, the thing about not publishing, in case someone finds out, is a real drawback. It's much better. Our stuff, I have to say, it all goes up as soon as we have it. Because it's not, it doesn't matter to me. Um, and it's great. You put it up there and straight away people will comment on it. It's just much easier. But the information we collect is a number of our funders insist on that, but we do it anyway. But there's a lot of information held in funders all around the world. Gates Foundation has so much information. Fortune on buy -in analysis. Government buy -in analysis. Allsaid has internal analysis. All that information, if it was out there, people repeat the same studies over and over again. And when you sit down to start a project and you do your research, what do you do? You find 10 things on roughly on the same topic. So I, I think data sharing is really good as well. Uh, uh, are you picking up this microphone? OK, I had, I had a question about the, um, the thing you're saying about moving into areas where for more for profit areas, that, that, that basic move. Is and I. Um, I was talking with someone at the um, national. His sense was that um, there, there was a poster child of a rational drug discovery. And, uh, and his perspective was that the initial screening data that identified that compound was toxic. Flaws in the data, and there were flaws in the data, would have been spotted. Earlier, if the problem was not necessarily anyone can interrogate the data. Mm. I guess this, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the origins of the open source area come from. That was the point he was making. So he, I think. Where, where others may be optimistic about it. More open 
that's the idea. And it hasn't happened yet, so that's, that would be my answer. I, I, that's so true. I, I think that's the biggest advantage. I think that's what people should talk about all the time when they talk about open source, having lots of good minds on a problem. And the thing is, you still won't be able to work out the failures. I mean, drug companies, if they could identify by looking at the, the chemical structure which would be successes, they would be so happy. It's very hard to know. But certainly, if you have critical, skeptical eyes looking at it, lots of them, because when you're looking at your own baby, it's always beautiful. You know? You're like, oh, well, I'm just ignoring that little bit and pressing on. And you know you need to keep getting grants for it and you want it to work and, you know, you lose your judgment. So I think that's, that's true. But that said, it, this is an enormously risky field. It, it, everyone that's done drug, done drug development, you just see them nodding going, it's true. Things look fantastic. They work in rats. They work in mice. They work in dogs. You stick them in a human, they don't work. <laughs> that's just annoying. But it's the fact. And you spend so much money getting there. So what Matt said is key. Early failure is what saves money. If you take something to phase three, you've already spent how many tens of millions of dollars. If you can fail early, it's the best thing you can do. And it also lets you move your money and time and effort to things more. There's just another question from Hazel again um, about the US Orphan Drugs Act. Orphan drug uh, gives a number of benefits to make things more commercial that ha only have a very few patients. Yeah? And there are orphan acts in place in Europe, the US, and other countries. Orphan doesn't work very well for neglected disease because how orphan works is it says, it costs a lot of money to make a drug. I will reduce the risk in two ways. I'll make it cheaper for you to make the drug by subsidizing some of your R&D. The big benefit is, you can have a monopoly on the market here, a, a complete monopoly for longer, to make it lucrative for you. The problem with neglected diseases, who, who in the US? They say to a US coming, I will subsidize your work, and then every sleeping sickness in the patient in the US is yours for 10 years. And that's all of them. <laughs> so it kind of doesn't work, because you get a monopoly on nothing. That's the problem. It's not commercial. So offering market monopolies on something worth nothing, you just a couple of things that could work that we've thought about. If you had reciprocal orphans, so sometimes there is a small market, like for malaria, military, travellers, um, mining companies, the stuff in places like PNG. If you said, if you get the orphan approval, that holds in every country with orphan. So you get the market in Europe, the US, Japan, Australia, Canada. That then starts to be a more sizable number of patients who travel, who work, who are in the military. So it may be that if you group it up enough, you can make it a market, but that will then still only work for things like malaria and TB. Because the problem with really neglected diseases is no one in the great, but it also means that all your natural drivers don't work. They're from MMB. They're MMB's figures, actually. Yeah, that that's a good point. It, it's that's a good point to make. The thing is, irrespective of open source, it's easier to make products for infectious diseases because you have a clear endpoint. If it's blood pressure, what's the endpoint? It stays down for a year, five years, ten years. Cholesterol is the endpoint. It stays down, or you get and then there's 20 other cholesterol products, so you have to compare it to all of them. Whereas for infectious disease, it's easier. You've got malaria, you don't have malaria. Uh, and the trials can be much smaller. They don't have to be 10,000 people. So it is cheaper. There are figures just for infectious disease development. The, the figures we use came from MMB, who sort of adapted them based on the industry figures and some experience. But up. 
not problem. The, the reason it's hard to get data for this, it will come, but it's not ready yet, is because this only started in 2000. Prior to 2000, no one did anything for neglect of this. I mean, I was with Medicine Sans Frontier, and you had drug bags that had an arsenic derivative, an antimony derivative, a bunch of chloroquine that didn't work. It's just diagnostic for lower lower was a picture of an eyeball blown up big with a picture of a worm. You know, this is just shameful stuff. So in 2010, we started making this stuff. And are you from, are you, uh, your product developer then? Are you making Yeah, but then, well, then you know that it, it takes about, it takes about 10 years, which is why we're just starting to see things now. And it's hard to know attrition rates yet. That's something we're trying to track. But this work is done by people all around the world. So you have to get all their data and then try and add it up. And people are still really secretive about telling you about their failures, which they shouldn't be, because that's what we that's what we learn from. But um, I, I I think they would be lower, a because it's more collaborative, um, b because it's infectious disease. But but let's see, it may be higher because we're a bit more inexperienced in this field. A lot of work, the drug companies know what they're doing. They've had years where we're going to be slower. Richard. I'm conscious too that I'm hogging the time, so I'm happy to hand over to someone. Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Jefferson. Um, Mary, my question is this. Why are we so obsessed with drugs? Your point about the United States no longer has tuberculosis, no longer has malaria, no longer has a variety of diseases that are now considered neglected tropical diseases, but in fact it doesn't have them because it solved them with public health interventions. Why are we so obsessed at using a drug paradigm to solve problems that other people have solved with public health interventions. Yeah. I don't know, Richard. I think because people like a, a simple solution. Public health intervention like stopping smoking is really hard work. It's like AIDS. You want to stop people getting AIDS. You've got to stop them having sex in certain ways, make them wear condoms, etc., etc. People want a vaccine because you can just bang it in at birth and say, well, I can't change what you do, but I've vaccinated you. I, I don't know, though. I'm talking off the top of my head. It just seems to me that people like... It's true in the West. People reach for a tablet rather than a prevention. Why? I have no idea. Well, if we look at the situations that you alluded to with mm. malaria in the United States, it was not done with drugs. It was done mm. by changing the patterns of standing water and many of the other features yeah. that led to the breeding of the, yeah. of the disease agent vectors. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious why. Yeah. Um, certainly your idea oh, is a simple about solution. Drugs. That's because that's the gay part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's something that's worth, worth serious consideration by if the community is driven by the desire to see an outcome as opposed to the desire to participate in a particular process that's dear to us, mm -hmm. um, it's always worth reflecting, are we, are we continuing a particular paradigm because it's one we're comfortable within or is mm -hmm. it because it actually is the right way to achieve the outcome yeah. that we desire? So it's worth internal reflection if we really want that outcome. Mm -hmm. I certainly I stopped should. doing plant molecular biology. Uh, not because I wasn't good at it and wasn't having fun with it, but because it was not going to give the outcome uh, that we felt was going to be desirable. Honestly, I, I agree. I think you need both. The thing is that while you're trying to change, trying to change behaviours or work on public health things, you still need to do something for the people who are sick. So you still need you still need to treat them. I think that's important. The AIDS debate early on went too far the other way, in my view. It was a real focus on prevention, and we're not going to treat the people who are sick because it uses too much money and we need to focus on stopping the problem. And I think you, for just for ethical and hum, humane and human rights reasons, you need to say, these 50 million people are sick, I'm also going to look after them while I work out how to stop another 50 million people from getting sick. So I think it's both. What would you guess is the timeline? Let's imagine a lead came out that was perfect right now for so the timeline uh, yeah. of taking this to, to its, what you were just saying, treat the people that are sick. So let's say right now, in some lab somewhere, is a lead hugely promising that ends up surviving all the way down through to a clinical trial. Let's assume it's in a laboratory at this point to be pessimistic. Um, what's the timeline before we start treating those sick people? And what would parenthetically be the timeline of a public health intervention such as bed nets? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, the timeline is, is probably around the same, but they're all, they're both, they're all happening in parallel. So bed net, malaria has been dropping. It's dropped by, I think, nearly 15% in the last few years. And that's because of a bunch of things. More bed nets, more spraying, and new drugs that work better than chloroquine. 
There's also education. A number of countries like Vietnam are starting community treatment instead of going to a doctor. So a, I just think it's not either or. Either or debates get are unhelpful. I think you need all of them. And if you put in all of them, you, you watch the impact. That's a lot of lives saved. Yeah, just quickly to come on that, the um, in the previous project that we did was on schistosomiasis, and that's that's particularly daunting because as a public health issue, because the land has it; it's in water everywhere, and to try and treat the land or something is extremely difficult. Um, I mean, you need clean water that people would then bathe in, and you can bathe in. And during that time, as you said, you have to do something because of these drugs. But as you're giving the drug, you're thinking, if I'm able to solve the water problem, then that'll be it. It's a difficult one. But there's nothing equivalent to bed nets for just a. It's easier when you've got a vector you can wipe out, like malaria. But it's much harder if you've got a generalized. Um, <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. It's very interesting.